Hi, I'm David Millington, the C++ Product Manager here at Embarcadero. Today we're going to have a quick look at some of the useful C++ features that you should be aware of and might want to migrate your code to use. These are all features introduced in C++11, which beyond Ostrostrup famously commented, feels like a new language. While the basics are still the same, the feel of the language has changed. I'm going to cover type inference, lambdas, new containers, and a few other small items like static assertions and atomic operations. Rather than just give a list of things that are new in C++11, I've chosen a few things that I feel are especially useful, and I'll give a quick overview of why they're useful as well. I'm not going to cover every detail, but instead show the advantages that come with using some of these features. Let's start with type inference. When many programmers think C++11, they think auto, the repurposed keyword. Type reference is actually bigger than just this keyword, but let's start with auto. Auto lets you not define the type of a variable yourself, but let the compiler decide or deduce it at compile time. For example, auto i equals 5, i becomes an int. Or auto j equals foo, j is whatever type foo returns. Type inference is more than the auto keyword, though. There's also decal type. This lets you query the type of an expression. Here are some examples. If i is an int, decal type of i is the int type. But to illustrate its expressions, not variables, decal type of i plus 5.5f is the type of that expression, which is float. That's great, but you might wonder at the value of it. You might even feel it's unsafe, since you may feel you don't know what type the compiler has chosen. It's worth pointing out that's not the case. Auto has clear rules for how it deduces the type. I'll give two examples where type inference is useful. The first is in templates. In a complex template, it can be hard to know what type of variable will be, and this especially applies to return types. The example that's often given is a template function that forwards a return type. But there are simpler examples too. Let's take a method that inside itself adds two things. What type is m? If a and b are ints, it would be an int, but if a is an int and b is a float, it would be a float. How do you specify that? With auto, you can let the compiler figure it out. Let's look at another example. When the STL was created, one of the selling points or benefits was being able to run algorithms or other code that interacts with collections even if you change the type of the collection. If iterators were defined, for example, std find would work even if you changed a std map to a std unordered map or a, or a hash map. That's fine in templates, but it's not so easy in your own code. For example, consider this code looping over the contents of a map. First of all, that's a lot of typing for a simple for loop. But what happens when we change the map to an unordered map? That will no longer compile and you have to change the type of the iterator. And that's a real mess for a simple type change. Instead, using auto, and with the type change to unordered map, it still works. But for something even cooler, since HashMap defines begin and end iterators, you can make the for loop even smaller. Compare that to the statement we started with. Auto reduces typing, remains strongly typed, is useful where the type isn't known when writing but can be deduced at compile time, allows easy changes, and allows more compact code. It's also worth investigating decal type, which I only mentioned briefly. It's unlikely you will use this nearly as often as auto, but it can be very useful for declaring types, especially in templates. So check it out. One of the other major additions in C++11 is lambdas. So what are they for? Well, they are an inline way to pass a method to something else. Ever since the days of C, passing methods, then as function pointers, has been useful. In C++, this was extended to functor objects, objects that implemented operator bracket bracket. But these require a lot of boilerplate code and pollute the namespace for something you might only write once. Consider this, you have a list of items. That, by the way, is an initializer list, a great way to fill in items in a container like a list or vector. 
If you want to replace all the 2s in it with 99, the old way to do this is with a functor. That's a whole new struct or class, and of the seven lines it has, only one is actually useful. The one defining operator bracket bracket. In addition, you lose the code flow. Reading that, you can't actually see what your custom condition is that you're using to replace. A lambda is a function, and they allow you to write functions inline in the place they logically are in code. The replacement for the above looks like this, which probably counts as zero extra lines of code. Not bad. You can use these in many other places as well. One of the key things is that they can bind values that are visible. Let's break them down. They are composed of three elements. The variable or capture list, the argument list, and code. And this makes the simplest lambda bracket 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 a method that captures nothing, is past no arguments, and does nothing. The code is simple. The arguments are like any function. In the above example, it was passed a single integer argument accessible in the lambda code as i. The capture list is to me the most interesting. You can capture any variables in scope by value or reference, and you can capture the class you're in via this. So a complete example would be this, which captures this, n by value, and j by reference. You can also capture all variables by value or reference, but that's lazy code and I would not recommend it. Lambdas can be easily inlined and are copyable. They behave like objects. That means you can assign them here using auto and pass around f. There are lots of interesting things to talk about here, but that's the basics. They are neat, inline in code, inlineable, anonymous function objects that can capture variables by value or reference. That means they're readable and performant. Next up are variadic templates. You probably already know variadic functions in C, like printf, which can take a varying number of arguments via dot dot dot. Variadic templates are similar and can take a varying number of type arguments. Here's a common example. The second template method is variadic. The first is required in order to resolve when only one argument is left. You can call this with any number of arguments. Here, z equals mult 1, 2, 3, 4. How often will you use this yourself? Probably not very often in your own code, but you may use code that uses it a lot. The most common example is tuple, which allows you to define an object holding an arbitrary number of values. The code you can see creates a tuple of three values and shows getting one of the values. Note that there's another initializer list. Tuples are a neat way to collect data without defining a structure just for the job. For example, they're very useful for returning several pieces of related data. You're almost certainly already using smart pointers, and in fact I debated whether to include them here. I decided to because in C++11, two smart pointers were standardized, shared pointer and unique pointer. It's particularly important if you are using boost smart pointers because you might want to change in some cases. If you're not using smart pointers at all, and some people aren't, this might be too brief an overview, but hopefully is convincing anyway. First of all, a smart pointer is an object that manages a pointer's lifetime. Mostly so that if used correctly, you don't need to worry about remembering to free it. It will be freed when the managing object goes out of scope, or when the last reference to it is destroyed, depending on the type of smart pointer. It implements operators star and arrow so it can be transparently used as though it was a pointer. It's a proxy object. Old C++ had stood auto pointer but it was less than ideal. It could not be used in the standard containers and was tricky to understand intuitively. The rule of thumb was not to use it and to use one of Boost's smart pointers instead. Typically, people often use Boost's shared pointer or scoped pointer. Scoped pointer is pretty simple. It retains ownership of the pointer and frees it when the scoped pointer object goes out of scope. Its replacement is unique pointer. Shared pointer keeps a reference count, and the pointer is freed when the last reference is dropped. If you're using boost, then you can move to std shared pointer without problems, and in general, unique pointer is a good replacement for scoped pointer. 
The difference is that Unique Pointer allows transfer of ownership. Shared Pointer has the overhead of managing reference counts. What I've seen in a lot of code is that Shared Pointer is used because it's easy, but it's worth avoiding this if you can. First, you can end up with cyclic references where one object is holding a reference to another that is referring to the first, so no reference count ever drops to zero. This is not a unique problem to Shared Pointer, but is worth being aware of. Second, it has overhead because it has to manage the reference count and do so in a thread safe way in an external spot. Normally, you want your smart pointer to have no overhead, to be the same in compiled use as a normal pointer. So, in terms of useful C, the recommendation is first, use unique pointer if you can. This is performant as a plain pointer. Remember, you can pass references to a unique pointer around, so the number of times you need to have multiple smart pointers referring to the same pointer is not nearly as often as you would think. Second, use shared pointer if you know you're going to want to manage the lifetime shared between objects. That includes between different threads, but don't assume this makes the object pointed to thread safe, just the reference counting referring to it. Finally, there are some nice helper methods such as make shared t for making a new shared pointer which is recommended for a number of reasons, efficiency and, and exception safety. In C++11 there is no make unique, which was an oversight, but you can define a method easily. This leads to nice code like std shared pointer foo p equals make shared foo. And the nice thing there is that you never write new or delete. In fact, canonical C++ is rapidly moving towards any use of new or delete being deprecated or a sign of bad code. They indicate manual memory management. There are a few more items that I want to cover, but I'll go through more quickly. The first is perhaps unexpected. If you've been using C++ Builder for some time, you've probably often used HashMap, an unordered associative array that uses hashes. You might not know that HashMap and some related containers were not part of the C++ standard. And when they were made available by library vendors, such as Dinkumware, they were non-standardized and so possibly all subtly different. C++11 standardizes these and adds unordered set, unordered map, unordered multi-set and unordered multi-map. Depending on your data types and needs, you can choose between map and a hash map, that's up to you, but you should prefer the standard types over the older non-standard ones. The second are the inbuilt atomic primitives. What's useful here is that C++11 defines a memory model, which means that the arbitrary imaginary machine that C++11 describes has predictable multi-threaded behavior. That might be predictably uncertain or predictably racing if you write bad code, but that's different to completely undefined as it was before. There are a number of primitives that will help you define order and operations. Most likely though, you'll simply stick to std mutex. Finally, static assertions. Static assertions are evaluation of a Boolean condition at compile time. This lets you check fundamental assumptions. For example, I used to write a lot of binary file reading and writing code. I often check structure sizes and the offsets of fields in those structures. A more common thing might be to check the version number of a library you're using. In the past, checking a Boolean condition at compile time was tricky and normally done with some clever code culminating in a custom macro, perhaps static assert x. This is now built into the language and you can write static assert size of float equals four, for example. This will give a compile time error if the condition is violated and print the message. For those of you who like finding errors when compiling, not when running, this is extremely useful. Everything so far has applied to C++ in general, but I want to talk about a few C++ builder specific items. We have a unique and powerful compiler and some great frameworks. If you're watching this, you're probably already convinced of the use of using cross-platform frameworks and something like FireMonkey is unique. There's no other cross-platform UE framework like it, both vectorized and GPU powered, allowing native controls and with a multi-device designer. To explain that, you might not really want to use a lot of time writing UEs. 
and you might want to focus on, on your code instead. With other tools, you either design a UE once and every user on every device puts up with something that's not quite right for their platform, or you design a UE many times, which is a lot of overhead. FunMonkey already cuts that overhead down, but the multi-device designer allows you to create a UE once and then specialize it per platform or per device. You can do something like create a mobile UE and then create a tweaked version of it for the iPad and another for an Android phone. Conceptually, it's like subclassing instead of writing the same code over and over. You can see in the image here a master view which contains the basic layout and then two specialized layouts which have changed the look and feel with just a couple of properties for both modern Windows and an iPhone. It saves a lot of time. We have similar advantages for our other frameworks. FIDAC, for example, is a great database framework that speaks to dozens of databases and works across all platforms. There's a huge advantage to writing code once and having it work with the same library everywhere. Finally, a note about our compilers. On Windows, we have three, the classic BCC32 compiler, which is the old one, and two new Clang-based compilers with our language extensions and interop support, one for Win32 and one for Win64. On mobile, we use the Clang-based compilers exclusively, and these are the compilers that are moving forward. The reason is that they allow us to support new language features, to stay up to date, and to take advantage of the optimizations and code gen improvements that you see in LLVM. If you're an existing customer and you have an existing code base using the classic compiler, moving to the new Clang compilers, they're not so new now, they've been around for several years, is useful. Why? They give you modern C++, you end up writing better C++. It's easier for you to compile for other platforms like iOS, Android, and Linux if you're using the new compiler on Windows too, and you get better optimizations and performance. These compilers are the future, so we encourage you to make sure you've upgraded. Some C++11 features are supported in the classic compiler. Not many, but some. Static assertions are an example. You can make use of some of the things I've spoken about today even using the old compiler, but the most useful ones require using the modern compilers. There's a table in the documentation listing which features are supported. If you're using the classic compiler, you can switch to the new one through a compiler option. In the project options, C++ compiler, turn off use classic ball and compiler. And if you want to experiment with the new compiler just to try out some of the code I've shown today, you can do that. Yesterday, we released the Win32 compiler for free. You can download it from the free tools section of our website, and the readme included in the zip file has instructions for how to use it, and includes a small demo program that uses auto, which would be a good start for you to try out some of the other language features. Uh, three quick demos to show that use a Lambda expressions with the parallel programming library in C++ Builder. The first thing to note again is under project options for each of these, in the compiler, you turn off use the classic compiler, and that will give you the full C++11 that the Clang Enhanced Compiler version 3.3 supports across all the platforms. And I should note that all of these three samples work very nicely with the Professional Edition, Enterprise Architect Edition, as well as the Starter Edition. So all of those are there. I'm using the VCL here. If I just had a main program, Without the VCL, it would work with the free command line compiler, which is available as well. So this first example uses the parallel for loop of the C++ parallel programming library. So if we look at the event handler for the second button click, I call the parallel for, and then here I have a lambda where I call is prime. This is the same function that is called in the non-parallel version or serial version. And inside of this if, I increment the number of primes that are found in this variable TOT. So here's the lambda, and I'm using uh, that index value to keep track of the looping through to get the number of primes. And then otherwise, we call the same function up here is prime that is going to look through using a regular for loop to see if uh, if it's a prime number or not, right? So let's just run this example and see the, the benefit in speed. So here's the serial for loop, and it took about 431 milliseconds. If I run the parallel version, uh, 113 milliseconds. So that way we carve out 
and start up as many cores as we can find, as many threads as, as Windows will allow on my machine. And I think I'm running in a virtual machine here where I give four cores to the Windows virtual machine. The second example is a uh, uses the task create to create multiple tasks. Each of these are going to sleep for different amounts of time. Uh, and here we might do some work, for example, but I'm just going to increment once uh, they complete whatever work they're supposed to do. And then down, once the tasks are created, we go and start all the tasks. So you can have any number. I could set this to, to 20 tasks in this task array. Uh, and then uh, create each of those tasks. And then I use the auto variable to start each of the tasks inside of the, of the array. And then at the end, there's two different things you can do with, uh, with tasks. You can wait for any task. And so it'll go and, uh, and see, okay, are any tasks done? And if those tasks are done, it'll say how many tasks are done. And I just care that at least one task is done. And then I call wait for all and wait for all, uh, we'll come back and say, okay, uh, that's very good. Uh, thank you. All the tests are now done and we can complete. All right. So and here's, uh, again, the, the lambdas for each of those to do some work, whatever the work is uh, that's needed. So we'll just compile and run this example. We'll start in the tasks. They're started. Uh, at least one task is done. That was the three-second wait, and now all the tests are done. And again, using lambdas inside of each of these task create bodies along the way. The third example uh, uses the futures, future variable, future value of the parallel programming library. Uh, let's go and look at the code. It just says, OK, we've got an auto future. We're going to do a future on a specific type of a variable, in this case, an integer. Here's my lambda. I'm going to sleep or do a very long computation and do a return value, of course, of the answer should be 42. So that'll get started, that, that future gets set, and then we can have the rest of our code here. I'm going to set the button caption to sleeping, and then I'm going to sleep for at least a second. This is going to run for two seconds, this future uh, calculation, whatever it might be. When I want to use that future value in, in code, uh, the thread will block at that point, waiting for that value to happen, the future value, which is this return value. So we don't have to do anything with threading. It's all done under the covers in the parallel programming library. And again, we can use a couple C++11 features, the auto and the lambda uh, in the body of the future. All right, so let, again, let's run this example very quick. And here we'll wait for the future. So it's sleeping and it's gonna wait. And now uh, two seconds went by, the future has a value 42 and the button is awake and happy, right? Some of the things I've spoken about are useful for different reasons. So code clarity is one, autos and lambdas. Obviously they're useful for other reasons too. Type inference in general is more widely applicable than just clarity. But one of the most important things about code is reading and editing it. Code that uses auto is clearer and easier to use. Code that uses lambdas retains the flow of code. When you apply an algorithm to something, whether that's a standard algorithm or something you wrote taking a function, you see what's applied the lambda, in line at the place it's called. That's great for comprehension. Then safety. Smart pointers easily fall into this category. Don't use delete in your code ever, and even new is not often required. Manual memory management has been a thing of the past in C++ for a long time, but with the standardized smart pointers, there's no reason not to code safely. Try to use unique pointer where you can. It has no performance overhead. Shared pointer is great, but it's something that I often see used where it doesn't need to be. And in terms of usefulness, that can be very non-useful, because when you return to the code, ownership is not as clear as it is with unique pointer. In other words, if a pointer doesn't need to be shared, making it shared obscures meaning. Static assertions are a great thing to have in the language rather than using complex hacks. And even if you didn't already have a macro defining these, using the inbuilt keyword is a great idea. Checking for errors at compile time rather than runtime is very useful. If you're already using a macro, consider moving to the keyword for less overhead. There's no macro expansion. I've seen projects which use copious quantities of macro-defined static asserts and the extra expanded code imposes significant overhead in terms of code size and run speed. 
the static assert keyword is very useful. And then a few miscellaneous items. Having standardized unordered containers is useful. They're a useful container, but importantly, moving to using these makes your code more portable. The standardized memory model is useful because it defines behavior. We're all writing multi-threaded code now, and in the past, sometimes behavior was undefined, and that was not a good thing. Having the memory model defined means parallel behavior is defined, which means you know for sure what will happen. Even if it is defined there is unpredictable behavior or a race condition, knowing that is useful, and you can control it with the low-level primitives in Atomic. Finally, C++ Builder specifics. If easy, high-quality, cross-platform code is important to you, especially if you want to provide a consistent UE across platforms, want native controls, want accelerated GPU support, and don't want to have to use a different external UE framework for every platform, FireMonkey is the way to go. Nothing else provides anything like it. It's a massive advantage to you to get your app out there for many platforms quickly. Second, upgrade to the newer compilers. You get better language support, better compatibility, and better performance. That's a win. You can even try out our latest compiler because we just released it for free. You can find it in the free tools section of Embarcadero.com. And here's a short list of resources. We'll add these to the blog post announcing the webinar and to the replay. With that, over to questions. Uh, that's the landing page for the command line compiler uh, that was launched yesterday. That's the free command line compiler where you can do C++ standard library capabilities and uh, use the C++ 11 language. And the page has a whole um, uh, comparison of what's in the starter edition, what's in the Pro Enterprise Architect, and what's in the free compiler. And Jim, I'll turn it back over to you for the Q&A and David M. Okay, great. <clears throat> Thanks, David and David, for that. Sure, it's the Davids. There you go. It is the Davids. <laughs> so uh, one of the questions here was, is all or all the stuff you're showing, is it work with the free C++ compiler? I think we've answered that question a couple times there. Yeah, except for the VCL. There's no VCL or FireMonkey in, uh, in the, the free command line compiler. It's got the standard... C++ runtime library, and it's got the Dinkumware, and the, and you can go and, and boost and so on. But uh, but as far as the language is concerned, absolutely. Even the parallel, all the cool, oh, the par uh, it should I should I'll double check, but I, I the parallel programming library is part of the of the C, of our Embarcado C++ runtime library. But let me uh, let me double check to make sure. Unless, David M., do you know? I'm not completely certain, but I, I think it probably does. Yeah. Um, I'll just yeah, test it. The parallel well. stuff is, is part of our RTL. We, we have quite a few useful things like that, and, um, and we do ship the RTL with, with the free compiler. Yep. Okay, so the question here is, the underscore try underscore finally deprecated and replaced by the underscore, underscore, try, underscore, underscore, finally, or both allowed? I was reading that question, looking it up uh, while, while David was doing his presentation. Um, I'm going to have to do more research and get back to you about that. I'm not completely certain. I know underscore, underscore, try, and underscore, underscore, finally are the ones that are documented and are, are the, you know, the, the recommended ones that we, we, we use. Okay. The uh, Roger saying that he noticed that the the Clang compiler takes longer than the classic compiler. Um, is that it expected, or is something wrong, or what's going on before him? To a small extent, that is expected. I mean, as as compilers sort of grow in complexity, um, you know, they they are slightly getting slower, and um, you know the the Clang compiler is slower than the old BCC compiler. Um, it does. It does a lot more, but uh, if if it is significantly longer, um, that's that's probably not normal. Uh, there'd be a number of things to investigate. I think the first thing to look at is is the use of precompiled headers. Yeah, there's other things you can do as well. Um, as you mentioned, the the Clang Enhanced Compiler 
is doing more. It's also doing more optimizations, and there are flags for turning things off, just as with even the classic compiler, there's compiler capabilities in the project options that you can turn off. You can turn off optimizations, for example. Uh, the other thing you can do with the Clang Enhanced Compiler is that you can uh, you can set up a number. There's a project option for compiling separate files in multiple cores. So you should check out the parallel compilation uh, capability that you can set if you have a multi-core machine and you can have the compiler compile different parts. Uh, you can set up the number of cores that you want to use for compiling, and that can, uh, that can enhance the compiler uh, specific speed as well. But yeah, the Clang Enhanced Compiler, it's doing more because the, it's the full C++11 language. You can go to the uh, C++ reference and see all the capabilities, and the team is continuing to work on newer versions of the Clang Enhanced Compiler to support things that are have shown up in, in C++14 and are being worked on over time for C++17. So it's a, it's a work in progress just as the language itself and the runtime library is a work in progress. I think, David M., you were just uh, in Finland a few weeks ago, right, at the, at the ISO C++ uh, working group uh, meeting way up in the north of Finland. You want to give people a little kind of color, commentary, and update of what was going on up there as the language keeps moving forward. Yeah, I, I was up there. That was about a fortnight ago. And, um, yeah, the, the standards committee meets a few times a year to um, to discuss some of the, the proposals about you know, the, the next version of the language. Um, and so this one was to finalize the committee draft for C++17. I think there, there are one or two meetings still to go to actually get that completely formalized to become the the C17 standard, but uh, basically we spent about six days um, in various meetings looking at proposals for the for the language and for for libraries and, and other sort of extensions, um, discussing papers and, and possibilities for what what would go in, and uh, quite a few things did go in. I actually wrote a blog post a couple of weeks ago, which is available on the Embarcadero blogs. I think that's blogs.embarcadero.com. Uh, which discusses that and, and, and gives a list of some of the uh, the things that were decided on and that are going into the next next version. So we, we've mentioned some of the newer standards beyond C plus plus eleven. Is it, where does the uh, free compiler stand? Is it just C plus plus eleven support? Or does it have some fourteen support? Or where? What about other newer standards? Uh, mostly C++11. I, I think there might be one or two items in C++14 that are that are in it, uh, but it has it, it has complete C++11 support. That's the um, the main one, the the important one. Uh, C++11 was was revolutionary, I suppose. It, it, it changed the language quite a lot, and um, C++14, 17 since then have have improved upon it, but haven't been you know, large significant changes. So uh, that's that's a good basis. And I should put in. Uh, I'm going to put into the. I'll put in the chat window. Is probably the right thing. There's a link to the C plus cppreference.com website where uh, different compiler vendors keep up to date their uh, their C plus plus feature set. And you'll see. Oh, uh, let's see. Let me click. Um, if you go there, it's, it's cppreference.com slash w slash cpp slash compiler underscore support. Again, that URL is in the chat window. You can click on it yourself. Uh, you'll see uh, several columns for all of the C++ language features that are in C++11, C++14, C++, and proposed as part of C++17. And I've been keeping up to date, and I'll have to turn that over to you, David M., um, the Embarcadero C++ Builder Compiler column. And so the two things you can do in that, let me see if I can click, I can click on the chat window and bring that up. Let me bring that, let's see if that comes in. Is that coming in, Jim? There it is. So if you look at two columns in there, one is you can look at the Clang column, and whenever it says 3.3 or less in general, uh, if you look in the Embarcado C++ Builder column, you'll see yes, 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 uh, going down, down, down. 
So as I mentioned earlier, the compiler team that, it, that builds the, C, the Clang Enhanced Compiler, which has our extensions to it beyond just what the Clang compiler has to support things like like VCL and FireMonkey and some other Delphi-isms because parts of uh, the runtime library and the frameworks are written in, in Delphi, some of it's in inline assembler, or whatever it might be. Uh, so a good place is to bookmark this page if you are looking for a specific C++ standard language feature and if you see something that is beyond the Clang version that we currently currently support, which is 3.3.1, I think, or something like that. Um, and that's the compiler that's in the free command line compiler and starter pro enterprise architect and even the 30-day trial uh, compiler is there. So that's a good way to keep track and to see what's coming up in future releases of C++ builder compilers uh, as we move forward to claim 3.4, 3.4. 3.6, 3.7, and so on. Did that come across sort of clear? Hope so. I think so. I have a couple of things to add there. We actually have some good documentation on our site that lists the uh, the C++ features that our, our compilers support. Yep. Uh, that's included in the in the resources uh, that I had on one of the slides, which we'll, we'll put up with the blog post and the replay. But uh, that breaks it down not only by the, the new clean compilers that we have, but also the old classic compiler. and um, yeah, it gives a gives a good detailed list of of the various C plus plus features and um, and what they do and what they are and uh, and what they're supported in and of course the the new Clang compilers are the ones that support support everything basically and then uh, you know the classic compiler pulls in one or two and um, yes like Clang is is moving forward and um, it's worth noting we're we're planning to to move forward with it as as well. Yeah, and you'll see down here the we update. Uh, this is this chart. Our, at least our column is based on 10.1 Berlin. So as we move forward, we'll keep updating this comment and the link that takes you back to uh, to that world. Yeah. So there's some things that we go up here that are in in later versions of Clang, like 3.7, that don't have anything put in them right now until we get to, to later versions, but go ahead. So you're showing the the parallel framework support that is uh, part of our extensions to it. The future value, when is that computed? Is that not computed until the future's used, or what exactly is the way that's computed? Well, I'm setting, I'm setting the future variable in that separate thread that inside of that lambda. So so wherever in your code you refer to a variable that it, a result that's part of a future, and you can have multiple futures. In my case, I only had one future, an integer that was the result of the function. So if you have, for example, x equals a times b, and if a and b are future values, uh, then that expression will get blocked under the covers until a and b have values. So if you have two separate tasks or futures that are running in two separate threads under the covers, one that's calculating something, maybe it's a long-running SQL statement that's going to give you the value of A, and another task that's doing some REST service of some kind that's going to give you the value of B, um, everything will block there. You could put a future, uh, an expression that has futures in it in a separate task itself, and then more of your main program can sit there being responsive in the UI or whatever it might be. So whenever you refer to a future variable that doesn't have a value under the covers, the, the parallel programming library will stop the thread that that variable is used in. Whether it's a sub-thread, the main thread, in my simple example, it's just the main thread. Um, so you, uh, that's how futures work. Under the covers, you just write regular code, x equals a times b, and if a and b are futures, uh, things will wait until a and b get, uh, actually get values stored in them. Right, I like to say that a future is, you set a future up for a value that you you may use in the future, and so that when you, when you need it, it will be calculated at some point before you're able to read it. So it will be calculated either during idle time after you've 
declared it, or as soon as you need it, it will block and calculate then. So yeah, that. Exactly. And you pass the type. So if the future is a string, or if the future is a double, or if it's an integer or whatever, you notice I, in the code, I I pass the type uh, of the future as well. In that, in my case, int. Is it possible to get the .pdb debug files while compiling with the free C++ compiler? Uh, no, we, we don't use the, the PDB debug format. That's, that's a Microsoft format. So uh, none of our, our compilers actually uh, generate or, or support that. Uh, there are free tools out there that convert to and from different debug formats. So you could, you could try using those if you specifically want PDB. Uh, are you working towards uh, meaningful error messages from the Kling compiler? <laughs> um, yeah. I'm, I'm not quite sure what that uh, question means, actually, so uh, perhaps, perhaps you could expand on that. Uh, one, like one of the really nice things about Kling is that it actually has better error messages than, uh, than many other compilers. Um, you know, so, so compiling with... You know, for example, with with your long template code, you often you can get lost in an error message trying to trying to figure out where where the error actually is, and, and Clang gives really good error messages in those those situations. So um, I'm, I'm not sure I can answer that question because I'm not completely certain what uh, like what what the problems are that uh, that you're seeing. So per perhaps you could either expand on that, or, or you could just send me an email. Actually, dot last name David dot Millington at Embarcadero dot com. I suppose what's meaningful to one may not be meaningful to somebody else. If, if, if they're different, that might be enough. Uh, I mean, you know, Jim, I should Sorry. chime in. I should chime in that the the Clang compiler is a is a community project. There's a set of committers, and if you go to the Clang compiler site, there's ways to report things to the people who work on Clang, including ourselves. Okay. Uh, debugging with the Clang compiler uh, seems to be somewhat strained. For example, stepping into library code is weird. Sometimes stacks seems to be off compared to the classic compiler, which reliably shows stack traces. For example, is that is there a, something work being worked on that to fix that, or is that something that we're aware of? I guess is the question. Um. Yes, so um, we, we do occasionally have bugs, like, like every compiler vendor, but we, we are aware of those and we do track them and, and fix them. Um, so I'm not specifically aware of those particular bugs of, of the stack being off compared to the classic compiler, for example. I, I haven't seen that myself. Um, and if you have something like that, ideally it'd be great if you can enter a, a Jira entry on, on quality.marketer.com, uh, preferably with, with an example so we can, we can reproduce it. Now the different but, uh, compilers use different debuggers, so... Uh, they, they do. We have something like seven different compilers yeah. and debuggers, a lot, something like that, which is uh, quite a lot to sort of maintain and run all at once. Yeah. So but, just uh, we, we, we definitely work towards quality here, and we're having an update coming out quite soon, which um, you know, includes a number of bug fixes, including to do with the, the compiler and debugger. So um, perhaps that will, that will fix uh, the issues that you're seeing. Uh, sorry, David, go ahead. No, I was just going to say there's some of the, in, in, a, in the classic compiler, that's, that's our own debugger that we've been working on since uh, uh, Turbo Debugger 1.0 and uh, C, Turbo C++ 5.0, uh, and we've moved that forward. And, and again, as we use more of the tool chain that comes with Clang and LLVM, we're extending the debugger to, and tools that are part of that chain uh, with our own expertise. So again, logging things in quality on marketer.com. It could be that we have to go back to uh, the LLVM uh, committers and, and get some things done on the debugger side, but absolutely put them in quality.marketer.com. With with the new language features of C++ 11 and 14, 
it would be a large enhancement to have the great VCL and FireMonkey libraries in native C++ to avoid the hassle with uh, the object Pascal moving between the two. Are there any plans to move in that direction? Uh, that's, that's an excellent question, and the answer is, is partially. Um, so we're, I, I think rewriting VCL and FMX in C++ would be a, a huge effort. And um, you know, we, we generate header files and that kind of thing from the uh, from those libraries, which which work very well. But there are occasional areas where you know it's, just, it's not perhaps not not very C plus plus style. And um, we we are aware of those, and we are we are considering options there about uh, how to how to improve those. We think uh, we, we can probably achieve quite a lot just by uh, you know changing some of the the C plus plus isms rather than. Uh, you're actually having to, to rewrite the entire libraries in, in another language. One of the, the great benefits with our tool chains is that you can use a couple of languages uh, seamlessly together. Uh, so you know, rewriting the libraries completely in one language instead of the other doesn't, doesn't seem to have a, a great benefit. And quite, quite the opposite. And, and there are other yeah. languages. I mean, there are other, lang there are other libraries that are built in other languages as well. And, and so, of course, the standard C++ library, but there's there's assembly language functions in libraries. There's Python libraries. There's you know any number of cloud-based libraries written in other things. As long as we provide the C and C++ interfaces, uh, then and there's you know there's non-C++ standard libraries even in Windows. There's C libraries as well. So uh, and rightfully so because you'd want to have many languages call into those libraries. Um, but in any case, uh, you know, as David mentioned, David M says, there's there's uh, some things we do in C++ and there's some things we do in um, in Delphi just because it's, a, it's an easy way to use multiple languages over the top of what amount to uh, s static libraries and dynamic libraries with interfaces. I know I've been in some meetings with, uh, like for example, our architects, C++ architects, and they're always talking about how to uh, improve that uh, overlaying and such. So yeah, that, that, it is something that we're certainly working on. Yes, it's, it's definitely something we're aware of. But uh, as, as David and I said, I mean, uh, you know, using using many languages is is really quite a, a good thing, and you know, should take advantage of the the benefits that each particular language gives. And um, if we need to work on the on the integration, that's that's certainly something we can we can and are, are looking at. So, uh, David M. Rogers asking you to paste in the links from the resources to the chat window so that everybody can grab those right now. Sure. That's something we can do real quick. I will just do that. Uh, and Roger's also asking if there's plans to deprecate the classic compiler or if it's going to continue being updated and available. Uh, there are no plans to deprecate it now at the moment. It's going to remain available. Um, but we are we are encouraging people to move to the, the new compilers. I mean, uh, the new compilers are the ones that support the new language features and, and the optimizations and you know, go cross-platform and, and all that kind of thing. There's um, sort of no, no reason really to, to stay with the old one. Now, that being said, you know, we, we have no plans to um, to deprecate it or, or remove it at all, no. Great, yeah. It's just a, it's a different flavor, a different option. Uh, da, 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 da. I think it's great to take advantage of, of the new language as it moves forward and, and that kind of thing. And um, you know, we, we want to make that available to to everyone, to our, to our customers, and that, that means using the new new clan compilers. So you know, we certainly would encourage you to move towards it. It's, it's you know, as I mentioned, and this this was a useful C plus plus talk, and, and using the new compilers is a a useful thing. One thing I've always appreciated about uh, our strategy for adding new features is we're really committed to helping make it, uh, the migration for our existing customers' code bases simple and keep supporting them. And so if you have somebody has something that is using for example, some feature that 
doesn't work in Clang but works in C++, the classic compiler, we still have the classic compiler available. But they can test it and see that it does work in the new compiler and uh, make those changes and small enhancements, and then they're able to use a new compiler with those new features. So I think it's great that we provide both as a way for people to move forward or take advantage of whichever compiler is, makes most sense for them. Yeah, that is, that is an excellent point. And the, the compilers are, are very backwards compatible. Um, you know, of course, we, you know, it is the same language with the same extensions and, and that kind of thing. Um, there are occasionally a few incompatibilities, but they're usually to do with uh, the way that the C++ language itself has, has moved forward. Um, we actually have a really good resource uh, on the doc wiki that, that describes any sort of issues that you might encounter and gives you a guide about how to change your code to, to migrate to the, the new compilers. And all the issues are quite small and I, I don't think are very, very complex. Uh, so hopefully that, that page is, is useful. Yeah, there was a question here about can you elaborate on variadic templates? He, he can understand about using tuples and things of that kind. Uh, we actually, the C++ team uses variadic templates under the covers to hide some of the complexities, for example, in, in having C++ work with certain capabilities of the Delphi language, uh, runtime type information, the, uh, the uh, futures, for example. So if you look inside of the header files uh, for some of the, or the HPP files, some of the wrappers for Delphi, uh, VCL, FireMonkey, things that are used with C++ Builder, you'll see a bunch of variadic templates uh, uh, involved uh, and being used to make it simpler to do C++ on top and hide all of those other underpinning complexities. And, and I've seen it used in other libraries as well where people want to go from, for example, C++ to a Python library. Um, Boost, if you look in the Boost community libraries, uh, you know, those are free and open source. You can download the whole Boost library. We ship a, a version with C++ Builder of, of Boost. Uh, you'll see in a lot of those places, you'll see variadic templates as well. Anything else to add, David M.? Uh, no, that's a really good example, actually. Um, Tuple, I think, is, is one of the, the easiest ways to understand a, a clear use. Um, as I said, I, I think they're used rarely, but they're, they're quite powerful. Um, I, I'm trying to think, there's, there's another example I saw recently. Um, I've seen many, many places where there's sort of overloads of, of a particular structure where, where you define something that accepts you know, one or two or three or four parameters, and eventually you have a right the library runs out of, of patience after defining a version that takes 10 or something. and uh, you know, the, being able to use a, a variadic template um, sort of removes that, that need completely. Yep. I think in our, in our doc wiki, we also have, uh, in the C++ specific section, we go through all the C++ 11 capabilities that are in the Clang compiler. And there's also this link on the cppreference.com site that uh, shows Clang and a column GCC and other compilers, Visual C++, Intel C++, and Embarcador C++ Builder. And if you go to the Variadic Templates area, and all of these have links directly to the technical papers for each of the pieces of the, of the C++ 11, 14, and now the draft uh, uh, C++ 17. So if you want to, and they, they're noted if they're C++ 11 versus 14, uh, and then some of these that are still being worked on, 17 that are in draft mode at least uh, for the next uh, year. And I know David was in Finland where uh, there was an agreement to have the draft released for C++ 17, but still there are work in progress and still a lot of compilers to, to get work done. So we're at uh, Clang 3.3.1, I believe, right now. And so you can see, though, that we're, we're continuing to move along because we have to add our extensions uh, for C++ to do things like Windows-isms and, uh, and and so on that other platforms don't have to care about um, and compilers don't have to care about. So uh, we'll keep uh, working on and adding support for later versions of Clang, which has some, you know, 3.5, for example, has some of the 17 things, 3, and 3 4, and 3, 5. Uh, so you'll get those uh, over time. And that's one good place here. I'll put that in the chat window, that link. 
that's one good place to keep track besides just in our own doc wiki where we where we document all that as well so i'll put that link uh in there in our own doc wiki where we have uh, examples and discussion of all the things that are in our latest compilers we have a couple of other pages in the doc wiki as well but um like this, this one that lists all the C++ 11 features that the uh, the Clang compilers support uh, with examples. Like they, they go into a bit of detail, and there's another one that has a table that shows the various features um, and shows both with the, the classic compiler and the new compilers which, which ones are supported. Of course, the the classic compiler doesn't doesn't support nearly as many of the the new features as the as the Clang ones do. Yep. But uh, both those pages are, are useful resources if you're um, yeah, if you want to know which which features the various different compilers support. Does the use of new language features help with optimization of performance? Um, not directly. In my, how about in my opinion, and then David M, I'll let you speak because you were with some of the people in, in Finland a few weeks ago, a fortnight ago. Uh, if you look at the C plus, ISO C++ work that's going on, you'll see... Uh, the goals, the consistent goals throughout the work, the major work that was done for C++11 and the work going, C++14 was more maintenance release and now uh, things going on in C++17 as new capabilities as well about, about things like safety, um, so things like smart pointers and other things that have been added to language, uh, simplification. So things like variadic templates to hide stuff under the covers to make things simpler. Uh, auto, of course, in C++11. So uh, more of it has to do with specific capabilities for certain types of applications, like, for example, the all the parallel programming for these large multi-core and large multi-processor type systems you see in things like telephone switching systems and so on. Some people are going off into the world of functional programming for some of these very complex uh, parallel type applications or multiprocessor applications. So when you look at the the reference and how it gets broken down um, in the language, you'll see things that have to do with performance on highly parallel and scalable type systems. Uh, I'm not about sure about optimization. More of the optimization work in my mind is still in the LLVM part uh, where there's optimizations down for the machine level. Uh, instructions on different chips and different architectures. But David, what else to add in the world of language features that relates to optimization and or performance? I think that was a, that was a very good answer. I'm, I'm not a compiler engineer, so I, again, I can, can only give a, you know, a sort of rough overview. Um, it might be better to say that, that none of them get in the way of performance and that compilers have, have some very good optimizations to, to take advantage of some of the features. So lambdas, for example, can be can be fully inlined if the compiler detects that that's that's possible. Um, you know, so using a, a lambda does not in any way imply that you get any kind of performance cost because a compiler is, is smart enough to uh, to to optimize that if it's um, if it can. And um, I, I, yeah, I, I, I think uh, David's answer about most of the opt um, optimizations being in the like the lower level LLVM and sort of like the code structure analysis is uh, is true. Things like unique pointer is, is notable as well because um, you know people people might worry that when you use uh, a smart pointer that it, it adds some kind of overhead and unique pointer you know, should have no extra overhead at all compared to a plain raw pointer. Um, shared pointer of course does that's that's one of the reasons I I mentioned it's it is worth considering carefully when, when you use it. Uh, but yeah, I, I think I would phrase it that, um, that none of the features uh, get in the way of performance and that the, the compilers are smart enough to, to take advantage of, of many optimizations. Let's see, shared pointer is not thread saved? Marcin or Markin is asking. Uh, okay, the thread safety there is tricky. Um, it doesn't apply any thread safety whatsoever for the object that's being pointed to, and that includes, or anything that you do with it, it includes destruction. Uh, the only thread safety is to do with the increment and decrement of the ref count. So you can safely have, you know, have, have a shared pointer be, be used by multiple threads, 
and the increment and decrement will be atomic, you know, it's just atomic increment and atomic decrement. Uh, but that says nothing whatsoever about um, the object itself or, or pointer, you know, the, the object that's being pointed to um, uh, of, of, the, of the shared pointer. So that might mean, for example, that uh, you know, while the, when the ref count descends to zero and the object is destroyed, uh, that will only happen once. But you know, there's there's no sort of guarantee about which thread that would happen on if you don't take care of that kind of thing yourself. Yeah, I'm going to put a couple links uh, in the chat window. One is about the goals of uh, C++, uh, at least the committee. Uh, in particular, there are general design goals and then there's specific goals. And some of them are things like maintain stability and compatibility, uh, prefer libraries to extensions for the language, uh, support expert and novice capabilities, increase, increase type safety. That was one that Bjarne Stustrup has always been talking about along the way. There is improved performance and ability to work directly with the hardware. So there's some hardware specific extensions. Uh, again, and and the fine final one I like fit into the real world, meaning consider considerations for tool chains, uh, in, in implementation cost, uh, transitions between different versions uh, at the uh, the binary interface level. So try to figure out certain things about the ABI, how the language gets down to the hardware along the way and teaching and learning, et cetera. So uh, general design goals, as well as some specific design goals. Uh, here's, I'll put the specific goal link in the chat window as well. So uh, all of these are in the ISO CPP FAQ. If you go to isocpp.org, that's the C++ language foundation, nonprofit foundation that cheers on. You'll find Stu Strips, uh, four chapters from his book called A Tour of C++. You can download the PDFs. Um, and uh, then there's the whole ISO committee, which is part of the ISO working group and so on. So uh, all that stuff is, is definitely available. Uh, again, check out the, the, uh, the, command, the free command line compiler. That's got the standard C++ runtime library and the standard C runtime library that we ship does not include things like VCL or FireMonkey or multi-device. For that, you'll need the starter or pro enterprise architect, but you can try the 30-day free trial if you don't have a version of CBuilder, because the trial is everything. You can build mobile, multi-device, 64-bit uh, everything uh, in the trial or the purchased version. Would all these features potentially slow down compiling performance? So, I mean, the language is, is bigger, and it takes time to compile it, and the Clang compiler uh, has some capabilities for tuning the performance. For example, you can run compiles in parallel, firing off separate compiles in different cores, and that's an option inside of the IDE under Project Options. You can say parallel compilation and how many cores to set aside uh, in your processors. Uh, you can turn on and off different options in the compiler, different options in the optimizer. Uh, there's a whole set of flows in the LLVM based backend optimizer that you can you can take advantage of depending on where you are in your development process. So check out all of those options in the C++ Builder project options uh, pages. And uh, can you add, so, you know, again, there's some payment that has to be done for complexity in programming languages. Uh, but then you get all the benefits of the capabilities in the language and the libraries as well. So can you add tasks dynamically? Yes, you can. Uh, I did. You saw me creating tasks. Oh, what's that pop up there? Go away. Um, uh, you saw in one of my examples in the PPL where I, uh, where I created uh, an array of tasks, and that was the wait for any and wait for all. So you can, uh, you know, you can create using a, dynamic array uh, or a static array, a whole bunch of tasks and start them all executing and then uh, wait for them all to complete. That's just part of the parallel programming library. You can search for the Delphi and C++ Builder parallel programming library, get to the doc wiki and you'll see all of the capabilities there. And I didn't even show you the, the different overloaded uh, 
methods in the tasks. If you did like task run and hit left parenthesis, or uh, uh, you'd see, I don't know how many, 20 or 30 variations of what you can, you can pass as parameters just on running tasks, for example. Uh, highly overloaded to do things. Anything else, Jim or David M., that shows up here? And you can check the status of every task. Yes, you can. There's, uh, you can go through uh, the array of tasks and see what the current status, whether they're uh, completed or running or, yeah, absolutely. Again, just go to the doc wiki here. I'll try to, I can try to find it for PPL and it, it'll give you all the documentation. And there's videos about parallel programming library on the uh, on the uh, in our YouTube channel as well. So here I'll put uh, I'll put the link there, and also I'll put it in the chat window. There's the link to the doc wiki for the parallel programming library. And for let's see, Carlos, where do you find documentation for returning users? Each each doc wiki version has a what's new in the version. Um, so if you go to, uh, for example, Berlin, I can type this right, and EN. Um, the best thing is to go to what's new. So there's the what's new page. Let me turn that on. So here on the doc wiki for the most recent release, which is the Berlin release, um, and then if you look after you do that, then if you scroll down and you look in the, uh, let's see, where did I get to? Oh, here, sorry. Go to the What's New page. It was on the main page. Here's the What's New page. So let me put that. Um, on the What's New page, if you scroll down the lower left-hand corner, there should be a link to What's New in past versions. So here, previous versions, you can go to, previous versions, Seattle and older versions, and that will get you to the what's new for each of those. So here's these different previous versions, and each one of those has its own what new section. So if you're down in 2010 and you want to see what's happened since then, you can just go to each of the doc wiki things and uh, click on one of them, get to that page. And again, you'll see a what's new in XZ8 and XZ7, XZ6, XZ5, uh, back to 2010. So depending on where you are coming from as a returning customer to a newer version or latest version, there isn't one where we take all the what's new from all the versions between one version and another and slam them together, but it's just quick clicks to get to the what's new. That'd probably be a good blog post, maybe. There's all the links and what's new. I know there's some stuff. I don't know if it's still there, David. There was a page um, on the CBuilder page or Red Studio product page that used to have what's new since then, but I think maybe that was removed because it was getting so long and cluttered that, let's see. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure it's still there. I think we're we're going to the what's new in the, in the documentation these days. Yeah, that's the right way. There used to be this page that went on forever, which had the what's new summaries um, going way down, but it was getting so long that it's better to go to the doc wiki and because you're going to come in from different versions, right? And you'll want to see what's new in, in whatever those versions are you're moving from and to. Okay. Anything else, guys? Uh, there's a question here about empty base class optimization. Um, I know that the, uh, the new claim compilers don't uh, First of all, the empty base class optimization is a sort of common old optimization. Um, the Clang based compilers don't support that, but that's uh, I'm just pretty certain that's that's because Clang itself doesn't support that, that particular optimization. It's uh, I believe not a very common one these days, but uh, I can yeah I can I can certainly investigate. Yep. And if you if you didn't find something and you think 
there's a feature that should be added or a problem, just go post a feature request or a problem report in quality.embarcadero.com. That's the portal uh, where you can give feedback to David M. He looks through the C++ related ones and the team does as well, the, the development team. So it's a great way to get, and also get people to vote for your feature requests if they're if it's a feature, a real feature request versus actually a problem. So uh, it's a great way to, to interact with the team in a, very, in a structured way versus on news groups and other places. Yes, I, I certainly second that. We, we do see everything that you enter and, and track it all. Um, and uh, you're welcome to, to email me as well. Uh, it's just first name, dot last name. So david.millington at embarcadero.com. I'm always happy to to hear from, from customers and users and uh, hear suggestions and, and that kind of thing. And and uh, Jens was saying he likes the new, uh, or someone, he likes the new installer. So there's two installers now. There's the feature installer, which lets you choose the features you want to install, the platforms you want to install, for example, and so on. And then you can go inside the IDE and you can go back under tools, feature installer, or manage platforms, whatever it's called these days, and you can add another platform and add some options or remove some options. So you can choose what to install when you need it. If you only need Win32, for example, I'll start with that. That's the default that gets installed anyway. Then there is the full standalone installer that's part of the ISO that you download, and then you you make all your choices up front, and then you use the Windows uh, Programs and Features uh, option and choose modify if you want to add or change capabilities. But if you use the feature installer and you want to uninstall or you want to change what's installed, you do that through the ID under tools uh, platform manager, I think it's called. I don't have the ID up in front of me, sorry, but that's what it's called. And that's all documented in the talk wiki as well. If you look for search for feature installer, and I forget what we called the standard installer. It might be the standard installer or the legacy installer. I forget. I'll find it. But yeah, we're trying to make that install experience just quick. Choose the stuff you want. The minimum would be C++ Builder for Win32 uh, when you use the feature-based installer because we need the IDE and we need the property editors that are associated with that since the IDE is still a Win32 IDE, even though it's a large memory model Win32 IDE for bigger capacity. So we need the designers and the property editors and so on. So that's sort of the minimal install. And that gives you the command line tools and the ID itself and so on. But you can then add Win64 and mobile and Mac OS uh, if you need them. If you're only doing Win32, that's sort of the default choice there in the feature installer. Small download and fast install. There's an interesting question here. What are the benefits of things like mutex from the standard library instead of RTL stuff like T mutex, T critical section, and, and so on? Um, I think it's a matter of taste, primarily. I mean, if you use standard library things like std mutex, then uh, you know, your your code is, is is more compatible. You know, you compile that with uh, with another compiler because uh, you know T mutex and T critical section are are ours. Um, and if you're if you're using you know, all the inbuilt standard library primitives like std thread, for example, you would want to to remain with the you know, std mutex and others. Um, uh, you know, given given the various methods and things that uh, that interoperate. Primarily, though, I think it's a matter of taste, and I, I actually personally quite prefer using the RTL primitives instead, like like T critical section and and our T thread. Uh, simply because I, I prefer their interface and, and the way you interact with them, I find them a bit a bit clearer to use. And of course, all, all of ours are across platform as well. I mean, they they work across every every platform that, that we support. Yeah, some of it. I think as well. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Tim. Go ahead. Go ahead. You're doing it. I, I'm fairly certain as well. We have a couple of other primitives that some. Um, not completely certain of this, so don't quote me, but a couple of other primitives that, that aren't sort of directly in the standard library. So, for example, we have VOT event, which is a, a wrap around an, an event. And um, you know, I, I uh, quite like using using that, for example. And there are ways to do that using the, the standard library as well, but I, you know, it's just a matter of personal taste. I like the, um, the RTL 
uh, classes that, that we provide instead. Yeah, I was just going to say that some of it is, is as David M. says, it's, it's developer choice and preference. Some of it goes back to the specific design goals from the committee of preferring libraries to language extensions. Uh, for example, the parallel programming library, we emphasize that, for example, versus adding parallel language capabilities. Now, some people are language junkies. Some people go, oh, that's just syntactic sugar, and that battle will probably go on forever in the world of programming languages, compilers, and so on. Uh, I love to soak all that up personally and, and professionally, uh, but but I've had conversations with Bjarne Stustrup, I think, in our Code Rage a couple times back, where he actually talks about, and, and I concur because we do it ourselves here, uh, that one of the things that's always good to do is to prototype capabilities that you might want to add to the language by creating a library first. So, for example, the Lambdas, Lambdas in Boost came from some Boost library work. It was actually library. Uh, they wanted to do more generic programming, you know. Um, and so it started as a Boost library before it was a language syntax. So, you know, there's a real world example of a Lambda that started as a, uh, as, as a library. And then uh, people got together and, uh, and hammered out what, a, what the syntax should be. Again, going back to um, taking care of the language and safety, safe programming. Uh, so having that uh, capture clause, for example, uh, I was involved in some other ANSI uh, programming language standards committee where people got together and just started creating syntax and no one had actually implemented a compiler to, or a library to try it out. So committees sometimes go off the deep end because they just get involved in this kind of head think kind of world of language syntax and what it might ideally be. Uh, what I love about C++ is there's enough C++ compilers as evidenced by that CPP reference page with the, uh, the you know, all the different compilers that support different parts of the language. Having, in, in one case, uh, GCC sometimes leads the way, uh, for example, uh, let's not get started on the battle, with concepts, uh, Bjarna pr uh, promoting the idea of adding concepts to language, which then sort of was subsetted in com uh, concepts light, and uh, none of that is in is is approved for the draft standard for 17. Uh, there's still a technical paper that's available for concepts. Um, so sometimes it takes a while to come up with a language feature that makes sense. Prototyping it at a library is always a great thing to do and let people uh, think about it. Question about cross-compiling to ARM processors. Uh, are compilers for iOS and Android generate optimized ARM machine code? So those are the two target platforms. We don't, uh, so, I mean, that's the, that's the targeting, again, from the Windows hosted IDE. Uh, we do ARM for iOS and Android. We don't do embedded ARM Windows and, and so on currently. Um, so... If you're thinking of ARM for other platforms beside iOS and Android, um, we aren't doing those uh, at least right now. And again, the, the next major platform we'll support will be Linux server side. Okay, which ARM architectures and processors do you support? There's a, a again, it, it's ARM on iOS and ARM on Android. And for ARM on Android, um, there's a doc wiki entry. We'll make sure to get that uh, link uh, in the blog post for this webinar. Uh, we need uh, ARM processors that include the NEON instruction set uh, for floating point support. So uh, you can check the doc wiki and the data sheet for C++ Builder and the doc wiki for target platforms that we support and the specific details, including versions of Android, uh, versions of iOS that we support. Let's see. Do you have any customers using this in a VMware Parallels Windows environment? Yes, we have both. I use Parallels uh, for the Macintosh, and I run Windows VMs, and I run the ID in those Windows VMs. So I have Windows 10, Windows 7 VMs, and for some legacy testing, I have um, uh, Windows uh, uh, XP as well. 
even though it's not supported anymore by Microsoft. But I run the ID on a VM, no problem. Uh, and then we have tooling that goes out to in Windows through the Windows Android SDK to your Android device from Windows, and we go through the Macintosh and through some command line tools that we get with Xcode uh, to get to Mac OS and iOS, specifically code signing and delivery of the built applications down to the iOS tablet and smartphone devices. Uh, question about Mac OS support. Right now we're doing 32-bit on Mac. We do 32 and 64-bit on iOS. Uh, we do 32-bit on Android. Uh, ARM processors. Uh, we're looking at uh, support sometime for 64-bit Mac OS, but it's not on our current roadmap. Linux will be the next targeted platform, and that will be Linux. Uh, Intel 64-bit is, is what's talked about in the roadmap. Let's see. Can auto be used to determine a function's return type? You can always get the type information. Uh, so um, you can do that on, on any variable type. Uh, Lambda support is not in the classic compiler. That's correct. The classic compiler, we used to call it, had C++ 0x. It had nine features, and those are still documented in the doc wiki. It had auto and a few other things. It's the, it's the Clang enhanced compilers now that have the, the C++ 11 support, and you can look in our doc wiki where we go through all the language support that we have on all the compilers. Also, uh, if you go to cppreference.com, it's a C++ reference site. There's compiler status table that's listed there, and GCC is listed, C++ builder is listed, uh, Clang, Intel's compiler, Microsoft Visual C++ compiler, they're all listed matching up the C++11, C++14, and C++17 draft uh, specifications and which compilers support which of those capabilities. So in the C++ builder column for 10.1 Berlin on cppreference.com compiler status, um, I've updated uh, to the fact that we're using the Clang Enhanced Compiler 3.3 currently in 10.1 Berlin, and we're working on incorporating our enhancements into more recent releases of Clang to give us more C++14 and C++17 support. So stay tuned. That's a really good resource, as well as our doc wiki, to see where in our compilers we have support for different versions of the C++ ISO standard language. Uh, so yeah, the old classic compiler did not have uh, So you saw in my examples that I ran for parallel programming where I used Lambda expressions, uh, I showed it, I think I went into project options and I had turned off just as David M. showed in his slide uh, where I turned that, uh, that compiler option off, meaning don't use the classic compiler, use the Clang Enhanced Compiler. Let's see, size of app generated with C++ Builder versus Java, it's not easy to make a comparison of size of generated app for Java, which is bytecode, versus our compilers generate native machine code, and pieces and parts are linked in, unless you use uh, die libs, for example, on OS X, or shared objects on Android, or DLLs on Windows, uh, then you know executables can be smaller, on those platforms. iOS doesn't support die libs or dynamic libraries. Uh, everything has to be housed inside of the sandbox of your application on iOS, so it, it's hard. And again, comparison of size of machine code versus byte code and what libraries and APIs are available or not is, is not uh, easy. You're comparing apples to oranges there. If you wanted to compare optimized machine code in C++ Builder versus machine code with other optimizing compilers that generate machine code versus bytecode, that would probably be a better comparison. Now, let's see, I had no idea there was a parallel programming library included in C++, but yes, it's there. Just search for uh, a parallel programming library or look search for parallel four or future variables or or uh, again, parallel tests. Uh, it's been in for a couple versions now. 
the only difference more recently is the support for lambdas, and that's where we can do fun, cool things to make it simple in your implementation of your parallel for loops, your task run loops, or task run calls, and uh, future variables. Uh, where can I find the, the roadmap? Uh, it's uh, easy. You just search for Rad Studio, uh, Studio Public Roadmap. Here, I'll get it and uh, and look for the, uh, it's an article that was done, I think it was in February of 2016, Marco Cantu's article. So I will put that uh, right in the Q&A log, and also I'll put it in the chat window, so you'll have a clickable link over there. Uh, yeah, the Parallel Programming Library, and, and we've done video, I've done videos, if you go to the Embarcadero TechNet YouTube channel, or just search Embarcadero TechNet, YouTube, uh, Parallel Programming, uh, you'll find videos that we've had, articles on our blog, and so on, and the help is there, just go into docwiki.embarcadero.com, so let me, uh, here I can probably find that, uh, docwiki. Uh, and then for Berlin, here, let me put that in the chat window. There's the doc wiki top level for 10.1 Berlin. And then in there, I'll put parallel. There we go, if I can hit the right thing. So using the parallel programming library, okay. So here, I'll put that uh, link here for you. It's there in the Q&A log and also in the chat window. And the parallel programming library is available for both Delphi and C++ Builder. Um, okay, so that'll get you to the parallel programming library. Let's see, where'd my window go with... Uh, uh, okay. I think, let me look and see if I missed any of the questions. Um, get time. Okay, I'm just catching up on some things that I answered. Comparison. Okay. Uh, yes. And again, back to VMware. I used to use VMware. I went to Parallels. They were leapfrogging each other, but we have employees as and engineers as well as customers that are using both. You can use host of the ID. Okay. Good ebooks on C11. Uh, C Rocks by Alex Corbin. That's a good one. Uh, I also like anything by Bjarne. Bjarne. Uh, uh, his uh, tour of C for chapters free is a really good start. Uh, let's find that one real quick. It's called a tour of C++ and the PDFs. Uh, uh, he's got a link to them on his FAQ, but it's also the four chapters are on the isocpp.org. So let me uh, paste that in. Um, isocpp.org is the nonprofit uh, foundation uh, to support and cheerlead the C++ standard. Uh, and so it's a great resource. I'll put the link. Uh, they put up news about C++ if you don't know about the site. Embarcadero is a, a sponsoring member as well. And so isocpp.org, you'll find latest news and books and articles and upcoming events, product reviews, uh, videos on demand. There, isocpp is also involved in the annual CppCon, which is coming up here in September up in the Seattle, Washington area, CppCon 2016. Uh, so it's always a, it's probably the top C++ developer conference on the planet anymore. And everyone is there, everybody on the committee, all the leaders, uh, Stustrup, you name it, people are there if they're involved in, in the real world of, of modern C++, CppCon. Uh, 2016 or CppCon in general. Plus, they also have all the past videos on demand from previous years of CppCon. Okay, uh, there we go. Yeah, we, I've had the luxury of uh, knowing Bjarna and working with him uh, 
off and on on panels and other things for the, probably the last 20 years or more, ever since we got involved in C++ back in the days of Turbo C++. And I've had them on Code Rage a couple times. Those replays are still up there on our YouTube channel. So, um, as, uh, so again, our 32-bit Mac OS apps that we generate will run on 32 and 64-bit uh, Mac OS still supports 32-bit. iOS is the only one that doesn't allow you to put 32-bit apps in the store anymore. Uh, so our Mac 32-bit apps run just fine on uh, latest Mac OS. Uh, what is it? El Capitan. And, Mike, and Apple has not done uh, anything yet to cut out 32-bit on Mac OS. Uh, they only did that uh, for, uh, they only made that requirement on uh, on iOS, where you can either ship a 64-bit app or a, what's called a FAT or universal app um, as a 32 and 64. So let's see, uh, supported Android devices. Let me... This is, I'll put the link in for what we have, and let's see, here we go. Uh, okay, so uh, looking at the doc wiki, if I can get back to it, um, we support Marshmallow, Android L, Kit Kat, Jelly Bean, and Ice Cream Sandwich in 10.1 Berlin. So going from old to new, Ice Cream Sandwich, Jelly Bean, Kit Kat, Android L, or Lollipop, and Marshmallow, Android M. And we're doing testing right now and, and seeing what we have to do for Android N or Nougat. Um, it's ARM Cortex-A series CPU, ARM V7 instructions, Neon technology, and a GPU uh, if you're using the FireMonkey framework. FireMonkey framework uh, uses the GPU heavily for bitmaps and 3D and for uh, effects. Uh, we do all of that to offload the CPU and push things to the GPU. And so that, again, I put the link uh, in that Q&A log, and I'll put the same link uh, for supported devices. Uh, we have a, there, in the Android Play Store, there's an app called SysCheck. And so uh, Android Play Store, uh, download SysCheck by Christopher Moeller, who's in our support team. The SysCheck app, if you run that on your Android device, it will tell you whether your Android device has the, the pieces and parts that are required to run a FireMonkey application. Um, uh, life cycle of an auto variable uh, is in the same uh, life, let's see, life cycle or scope of where that variable is defined. So there's nothing different uh, in an auto variable versus a direct, um, you know, directly defined type uh, in whatever scope you're using. So um, if it's a global variable or a class field or variable, then and you're using uh, a lambda or whatever, you're going to have to, you know, use the uh, use the right uh, support to get to that external. A variable, whether it's a global or whatever. If it has to do with threads, anonymous thread, uh, then again, you'll either have to have the right capture clause or or do something, pass it, uh, pass it as a parameter. Um, you saw in my samples, I had some global variables. I also had a class variable on my form, and uh, and I could get from inside of a lambda, I could still get to. Uh, those external variables by doing the right uh, connection. And as David mentioned, don't just cop out and put the, this pointer uh, and get everything. The whole idea of, of uh, capturing is to limit uh, what is accessible uh, versus having access to everything. But that's your choice. You're a developer, and you can use tools like these to do all sorts of interesting and crazy things. <laughs> 